So hello everyone and welcome to the DeerCast. Uh, it is just Harry and I today. Um, so last time we did one of these was uh, August. Uh, we're recording this in November. Um, we're pretty hopeless in case you hadn't already realised, so God knows when this will get out to you. Um, if it's Christmas time, then Merry Christmas, ho ho ho. Um, if it's the new year, then uh, Happy New Year and um, yeah, good luck. Um, <laughs> If it's November, then I mean it won't be November, will it? So I don't know why no. I'm even don't know why I'm even saying that. It'll be December. I, I'd have thought at some point. Yeah, at, at best, maybe um, January. Yeah, um, and we just thought we'd bring you a little update of what we've been up to, what we've got coming up, um, kit we've bought, how the fallow season's been going, etc., etc., etc. So, do you want to kick us off, Harry? What have you been up to? Last time, you'd had two fallow. It was the beginning of August, so you'd just started to wade into them. Well, before we get to any of that, I oh. think I'd like to introduce a slightly new segment. Not a new segment, but a new element to the podcast. Go on. Tom and I, for some reason, have only just recently discovered that we're both quite partial to a wee dram of whiskey. And yes. Tom, we're recording this in Tom's house, and Tom has got an enviable collection of whiskey, and we we'll, I thought we'd just describe for the listeners what, what we're sampling this week. And we're having a lovely Glen Goyne, 18 years matured, uh, Highland Scotch single malt whiskey. The, uh, and we're having it with ice. So that may put some of you purists off, but you know, if any kind of naughty language comes out, then you know why. Yeah. I don't, I, honestly, I don't know why it's taken us this long to realise this and to actually do this as a bit of tradition. I, we normally have a beer or two when we're recording these. Yeah. But I think last time we recorded a podcast and then we had to load up Harry a load of ammunition because you'd run out. Um, yeah. And to see us through that process, because we did it all in one night, um, we ended up opening a bottle of whiskey, didn't we? And mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like it helped us load some more accurate ammunition as well. Well, I haven't shot them all yet, <laughs> so we'll find if any of them go, then I'll know. I'll know why. Mm. I hasten to add, we didn't drink a whole bottle of whiskey whilst we were reloading. And we would not advocate to drink and reload or shoot for that matter. Yeah, but drink responsibly. Um, and yeah, drink, enjoy, drink beautiful whiskey. Yeah. Um. So what have I? What have I been up to? Well, I mean, obviously the fallow season is now in full swing. Mm-hmm been very busy on the on the doe cull mm-hmm. um i've been trying to shoot you've been trying a different a slightly different tactic to me in the sense that you're you were thinking about leaving on the advice of Ben beardsmore the bucks basically until the last minute and then only really st- starting to shoot the does what was the so I, what was the strategy so i've i've got two farms that have got fallow um and one of them I've had for a long time, and one of them I only got in August. Uh, so the one I got in August, I've just absolutely declared war and complete Armageddon on anything that moves. So any fallow that moves there dies, and has done since the 1st of August. Or, sorry, male has died uh, until recently when the females have started dying as well. Uh, the other farm I've had for a long time, and my strategy there had always been similar in terms of basically as soon as the first of August rolled round, I just let rip and killed everything and anything. But then what I found was come December, January, February, like the deer just disappeared and then they'd start to sort of come back in March and April. And I was then always kind of fighting to catch up. Owen's advice or what I thought Owen's advice was, was maybe have like one or two fallow in September and August and October but then rear, don't roll your sleeves up until November. So on that farm, that's what I've been trying to do is sort of just, or was trying to do, was go very gently at them and then like let rip in November, which I think has worked to some degree. Hmm. I think the, the added complexity on that farm is there's a shoot there. And basically as soon as that started, like there was a noticeable difference in the fallows' behaviour hmm. in terms of they were much more skittish much more nocturnal and yeah just a bit more annoying to stalk um on the other place where i have gone at them hard from day one well i don't know i was out this morning and i did feel they were more on edge than at the other farm perhaps Mm -hmm. i don't know i mean again maybe it's just my bit of my imagination but so 
I think across the board, I've probably had, well, I know on one place I've had 50 fallow so far. And on the Blimey. other, I've had seven or eight, I'd say. So, Pretty yeah. Pretty good going, yeah. Because I, I find a similar problem with my bits of ground, but the other problem I have is that I know for a fact that I share two of the big fallow populations with another estate. And obviously, there's absolutely no guarantee that they're going to adopt the same strategy as me. Um, Harleton might try. So my approach is normally just to try and be consistent and sort of take one a week sort of thing. Um, but that is often often challenging and sometimes it makes sense to have two or three in one sitting. Um, but I think it's interesting to try it as a new approach. I think I have to see at the end of the season if it's yeah. yielded any different results. I think where it would work really well is if you didn't go hard at the fallow and then literally on the 1st of November you filled mm. every single high seat yeah. and you just killed everything that moved because what I found was the first few times I went out in November, everything came out much earlier mm. and just with a bit more confidence, a bit, well, you were sat in a high seat with me the other day and a group of does came out at like 4.30. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, just for reference, it's it's dark around five o'clock, so they were out well before mm. um, sundown and managed to get, what did we get out of that group, two? Mm. Yeah. Before, like quite easy, was it three? Uh, it was two, I think, in the two. end. Yeah. Like quite easily mm. before they were sort of like, oh, we better make tracks. Whereas on the other farm, they they are coming out right at last light, mm. um, and they're right on tippy toes already. Yeah. And like in the mornings, they're back in, back in the woods by well, like well before sunrise. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So there it is there is a difference. Yeah. And it is challenging at this time of year with the light and just really be only being able to stalk on on weekends or sort of early morning sometimes um yeah it's it's the normal kind of slog and then fighting mm. the weather and the mud and everything else but you know it's the mm. it's the hard yards isn't it this is when you really make the dent in numbers and this is the kind of work of the culling element of deer stalking i guess yeah yeah this is when the work really pays off hopefully yeah um but no, I th yeah, it's been good so far. I'm still enjoying it. Uh, I'm also going stalking next week in Scotland, so that's nice. exciting. Bit of a busman's holiday yeah. for me. <laughs> um, oh, I'm trying to think what else has happened since the last time we did one of these. Um, well, Tom and I have, I think we mentioned the last podcast, taken on some new ground. Yeah. And the landowner has asked us to also do some fox control, which... We haven't really done historically. I've I've done a bit in the past, but not nothing kind of uh, nothing like technical. I haven't really. I've just been doing kind of like you kind of driving around a Land Rover, lamping them with a twenty two two fifty. I've never done any kind of like um, strategic culling of foxes. Um, so Tom and I have been delving into the world of night vision, which has been oh my god, an interesting. Yeah. If, if you can't tell already that we are strictly deer stalkers and nothing but deer stalkers, this this is about to show you our level of skill and expertise. So yeah. both of us obviously have got deer caliber rifles to start with, not two two threes. Both of us have got nice scopes on the top of all of them, I'd say. And so therefore, and both of us are cheap skates. So both of us are like, well, don't have two two threes to make into dedicated nighttime setups. Don't really want to start taking scopes off and putting day night scopes on or anything like that because we want want them for doing the deer. So like, well, what's the cheapest, easiest solution to this problem? And it was for both of us a Pard NV007. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a new version, but with yeah. again both being cheapskates, we went for the old version. Yeah. Which you can get for two hundred and eighty quid. Yeah. Very good value, really. Yeah, I, on the face of it, I was amazed because yeah. you bought you bought yours first, and you were using it for a while. Yeah, and very kindly let me use it, and then I was converted and thought, okay, let's do it. Yeah, but potentially both had some issues, which we're hoping some of you, as the listeners, might be able to help us with, because some of you might be more experienced in this area than us. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not expensive bits of kit, but they're not, I wouldn't say, the best build, best build quality in the entire world. And I had, I've had some problems with the battery, especially, in that if I don't keep it on charge, basically 24 hours a day, um, when I get to use it, it's like already on half battery, which is just like, oh, it's so frustrating. So I have, I've now bought a separate dedicated battery charger, so I kind of solved that whole problem. Um, but they are just quite, they're quite fiddly I, bits of kit as well to use. So I've, I've not had that issue. Okay. I have had the issue that the on button is very sensitive. Yes. In terms of like, for me, and again, yeah. maybe it's just because I'm a deer stalker, but with it, with it mounted on the back of the scope, yeah. As soon as like if I fling the rifle over my shoulder, yeah. Um, with with the sling to put it on my shoulder, I can sometimes then go to pick up the rifle and the part is on. Yeah. And some like somehow I've nudged the button and it's come on. Yeah. Or I've had it like in my pocket, mm. in my smock or something, and it's been on for like an hour. And I'm just like, oh, fine. brilliant. <laughs> it's now basically out of battery. Um, my issue with it mm. is not that, is that I've. Well, I have shot some foxes with it now. Yeah. Um, but I've also missed some foxes. <laughs> and that's... Mm. I, I know my rifle is zeroed bang on, and I, I'm not a terrible shot before anyone says anything. And I've had some foxes that have been like, sort of broadside for all intents and purposes, 150 metres, normally point, click, and they're dead. They, with the pard on, point, click, they run off and seem absolutely fine for all intents and purposes. Get over to shot site, no blood. Dogs like, don't know what you're looking for, mate. Hmm. Um, and I just don't know what's going on. Yeah. And I've had a similar couple of instances, um, which leads us to believe that it's not us being idiots, or maybe it is. Maybe someone's yeah. going to say, you idiots, you need to do this or, or that. But... From speaking See, to a couple of people, we might have stumbled across a problem. Two potential problems that have been suggested to us by different people. So one person said, have you zeroed the digital reticle in the pod with your normal reticle in your scope? So I've got to apologise because for anyone that doesn't use a pod or that isn't interested in night vision, this can be really boring, but bear no. with us. So there's that issue. Someone else has said the mount that the pod comes with isn't brilliant in terms of attaching itself to your scope. And so if you get that slightly wonky, it means the pod is looking slightly wonky down the scope. So it means, I guess it's creating a parallax issue. Mm. And so therefore it means that your crosshairs aren't actually pointing where they're pointing. So they said, one, zero, the digital reticle with the normal reticle. And the second one is a few people have, have, have recommended an Eagle Vision replacement mount that basically attaches the pod to the scope, but does it in such a way that it's perfectly aligned and parallel. So 75 quid later, Eagle Vision mounts on the way, uh, and uh, we're going to try digitally aligning the reticle and see if that makes any difference whatsoever. Question for you. Yeah. When you're zeroing the rifle, have you been doing it with the pod on? No. I wonder if that makes any difference. Because you can use it in the day. Yeah. In day mode. But then, what 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 happens when you're then using? Because say oh. your re- say your zero is different. Mm. What happens then when you take the pod off and you want to go back shooting deer? No, it's a problem, isn't it? Maybe the problem with it is that it's trying to be, it's trying to be too clever, and that you know. The real thing to do, ultimately, is just to have a night scope. But the thing is, I, I know people who use the pod successfully. Hmm. I know people who've killed a lot of Newcastle supporters whilst using uh, the pod. Brian Main's army. Yeah. But how many shots have they taken at said creatures? So, so like, some of them, they've done two or three years on the cull. Hmm. And they've used the pod the whole way through wow. and been very happy and successful with it. Mm. So it makes me think there's, we're just doing something yeah. silly. And I'm sure lots of people, I mean, I know lots of people successfully fox professionally with them. Yeah. So we probably are being completely idiots. I mean, I think as a bit of kit for the money, I mean, fucking Good bargain. Unbelievable. And when I've, I have had to buy a separate scope for my rifle because my rifle scope doesn't have parallax. 
we also found that any really fancy scopes like a Swarovski or a Zeissor or whatever that have like a sort of, um, you know, the, the complicated coatings on them don't seem to work as well as the very cheap and cheerful like Hawk scopes. Yeah. And that's what people seem to say online. So I've gone out and bought, bloody good actually, a Hawk, I think it's a Hawk Vantage. It's a, I think it's a two to seven power scope. 65 quid or something. What? Bomb, bomb proof thing. Yeah. That's ridiculous. I know. But it's only, uh, it's got a 40 mil objective lens, so it is quite small. Mm. It works absolutely perfectly on the pard. Um, because obviously you're not worried about light transmission. Yeah. Um, the pard has got digital zoom, so you're not really, you don't need like 12 zoom or whatever mm. on it. Um, and it just seems to work an absolute treat. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with that. Yeah, and Hawk, Hawk scopes actually seem to have gone up a hell of a lot in quality in the last couple of years because they used to only really be air rifle scopes. Yeah, but now they've I think all of their range, maybe apart from their like air ones, are centerfire rated. I think up to like three hundred eight, and they're bloody good value. I've got one on a seventeen HMR as well, and it's it's bloody good piece of kit. You know, I think they're criminally underrated. You can get a really nice one for like three hundred quid, four hundred quid. That's crazy. Right. I wonder, maybe that's what our next scope review ought to be. We ought to get one of the high-end Hawk scopes and see yeah. how it compares. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it, light transmission and clarity and all of those sort of things are never going to be it, as good. But will they not be? That's the question. Well, that is a good question. And um, the, you know, the, 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 the build quality is pretty good. I think they're pretty... Pretty underrated. So did you say you'd bought a Vantage? Yes. So I'm guessing Frontier must be the top end then. I mean, to their website, they've got a picture of one mounted to a 50 cal. <laughs> so recoil's not an issue. Um, Apparently not. Okay. The one I got in fairness was a 20, like a one inch. Is that 25 mil? Yeah. Tube? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you want a 30 mil tube, then it like doubles in price. So, I mean, even in fairness, their most expensive scope is a 3 to 5, uh, sorry, 5 to 30 by 56. <laughs> I mean, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Only a thousand quid. I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? When you look at like what you'd pay for a, like a Night Force. Yeah. With the same capabilities, it would be ridiculous. I mean, yeah. clearly they're not comparable, but, um, you know, I think in the last 10 years they've come on so much, because I used to have one on my air rifle skirt, on my air rifle, and it was absolutely pants. It was like the sort of Nico Sterling. They, they, the website looks very different mm. to whenever I, I last looked on it in terms of they've really upped their game, and yeah. the, the scopes actually look very, um, very impressive. Yeah. I feel like the sort of scope market is really becoming more of a level playing field. I don't know if it's technology or glass manufacturers or whatever, but, you know, there used to be, if you didn't buy German, you were basically an idiot. But now that the Germans are making their scopes, some of them even in China or in, you know, other parts of the world, that a lot of these other cheaper scope manufacturers are also making their scopes, you know... There isn't such a discernible difference. No. But in quality, you know, you look at like GPO, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that is seriously good quality glass mm. for an absolute steal. Yeah. Um, Hawk are really, really impressive. There's a new scope manufacturer every single day that comes out, and you think, oh, actually, that's uh, that's not not so bad. I'm trying to think of other ones now, actually, off the top of my head, that aren't the sort of traditional ones. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Maybe so I, we should do a review of the sort of most underrated scopes yeah. out there on the market. Suggestions, please, everyone. If anyone out there has a scope, you're like, oh, that looks that looks too good to be true. That looks like a bargain. Let's know. Send, we'll see if we can get details. a see if we can get a one to review, and we can compare it against a sort of market leading Leica or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And see, you know, see whether it's worth the worth the difference. Exactly. Yeah, we'll have to have a look. So, what other kit have you bought since August, Harry? Uh, I haven't bought. I have not bought my kit, Ralph, my Bagara. I, I don't think this is ever going to happen. It will. It 
Like I'd it. also like it noted on the podcast that I had not mentioned the K word. We're 20 minutes in and you haven't... You... I think you won. And you just mentioned it. I mentioned it first. Yeah. I have to drink now. Um, I don't think this is ever going to happen. It, will, it will happen. I've lost, I've lost all faith and confidence. The problem is that I have a 243 from Yonks ago that I had sitting in the cabinet that I was like, oh, I'll chop this in for my Kip Lauf. Uh and then this opportunity to do some foxing came along, so I was like, oh, brilliant. It's a perfect foxing rifle, because I've got some, like, 50-grain bullets. Just get a 270 in the kit plow. Oh, I value my shoulder. And With my... a moderator, you'll be fine. Or oh. just get a, just go gay and get a Creedmoor. Go gay and get a Creedmoor. I really like the 243. I just... Call me old-fashioned. I like what I know. And I just... Or use the kit plow as your foxing rifle. Because yeah, t- think about it, think about it. You can't you put could, a thermal on a kit plow. Yeah, but sorry. you won't. You won't need. You can. That's ridiculous. You can, but you won't need to. Well, sorry, you will need to. But you can, you can do your foxing in the winter, and it'll right. be dark, so no one will see you using a kit plow. And then as soon as spring and the robot season rolls around, mm. the night vision I or thermal just, vision off. just clips off. Quick detach mounts, and you put a traditional scope back on. So why haven't you been foxing with your kit plow? Because. That's a sin. My, <laughs> mine is a wooden stocked, beautiful kit plow. You've been talking right. about getting a plastic, fantastic utility kit plow. You know what? I'm case, not averse to it. In which case, fox away. I am not averse to fox it. Fox away, my friend. But my my idea is that going after some muntjac or some roebuck in mm. sort of spring. So I'm aiming for that. I think in the in maybe March it'll it'll so happen. By the time we get this podcast out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so you I, haven't bought that, but what? Anything? Any other kit you've acquired? Uh, I don't think so. Apart from a thermal and a new scope. Uh, no. So I I realised once we started recording, I have bought new sticks. Oh. Some carbon yes. fibre Vigaflex ones, which I had I had no good reason to buy. I just I just had one of those moments where I was in a gun shop, they had some carbon fibre ones there, and I was just like, fuck it, I'm gonna do it. And they are they are significantly lighter than the normal ones. they they are quieter in terms of they don't when you like knock the legs together, they don't make the same like clattery mm. noises. Yeah. Um but actually the best benefit I'd say is that they don't suck all the heat out of your hands in the winter mm. on like cold mornings or evenings. Oh uh, yeah, like you can, I can quite happily have them in my hand, and then it's not like holding an icicle. That's very true. I never thought about that. Aluminium sticks. Yeah, the aluminium ones. Don't they have a little plastic condom over them anyway? <sighs> they do, but only. At, so well, depending on how you fit them, but only at certain points. Oh right, okay. Um, and even still, I I found them, I definitely find them colder than the carbon fibre ones. Interesting. And apart from that, they're in every other way the same as the normal ones. Yep. Yeah. Apart from very annoyingly, they are smaller in terms of diameter, which is is great because when you put them in your hand, they feel smaller and they're easier to carry. But if you've got a fifth leg or any other accessory, you need to buy a new version because they don't fit. Um, that's not very Viperplex, actually. I thought they'd make a little adapter or something for that. Because they normally are very kind of yeah. customer-focused in that way. Which that is, is very annoying. So you've got to spend another... Oh, you've got to get a carbon one as well. Yeah, yeah now I've got to go and get a carbon How much fifth is that? leg. Oh, God knows. 100 quid? Well, I've already got it, and I just didn't look at the invoice. So Tom. I know. So Have you still got your old sticks and fifth leg? Or have yeah. Or you sold a lot? Still yeah. got them? Well, Alex from Hunter Gatherer Cooking wants them. Oh, there you go. Okay. So I, d- I did put them on um, uh, Instagram to make myself feel better. Literally, I walked out the shop with one pair in one hand, got into the car, and my other pair were in there, and I took a photo and said, does anybody want these? Wants them. By the time I got home, Alex had already replied and said, I'll have them. So you're going to charge them double, presumably? Oh, yeah. 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 Alex doesn't listen to this podcast. No, so. exactly, yeah. Well, this would be the ultimate test, won't it? Yeah. yeah. Is he a real fan? Yeah. He'll pay. Says he's a friend. He'll, he'll actually financially yeah. incur a cost if he if, if he listens to this mm. and tells us, I'll, I'll give him a discount. Next time we speak to him, oh, yeah, yeah, I listen to the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Liar. 
What about those sticks? <laughs> thousand pounds um, worth. So we bought that, and then controversially, I bought a new sling. Oh, I didn't know that. Because I am a huge fan of the Nigolo rucksack style sling. I love it. I honestly game changing. Put the rifle on your back. Yeah, hundred percent. Like then you've got both hands free. Yeah. You can clamber over a fence, you can do whatever you like, the rifle's there, it's secure. Once you've got it set up, it's brilliant. Um, you can quickly get it off. Um, you don't get the same like pain on one just one shoulder, it like spreads the weight. You also don't walk like hunched, so not hunchback, but like tilted because mm. you're trying to keep the rifle on one shoulder. But I was out one morning last week, stalking into a group of valet got to within about 50 metres. They were on a track in front of me and I was kind of just slowly creeping in, creeping in, creeping in. Got the sticks out and I was like, right, time to get the rifle off my shoulders to take a shot. Sticks are up. And I, like, get the rifle off and I kind of bring the rifle round and start putting it up on the sticks. Ooh, yeah, yeah. And the Niglo Ruck sling, it's got obviously two, essentially two slings, like one for each shoulder. And in each one, there's a plastic buckle and what happened was as I was putting the rifle up on the sticks, the two plastic buckles not only knocked together, but then knocked against part of the, the plastic part of the sticks. And it just made enough noise that even I was a bit surprised. The group of fellow in front of me just immediately clocked it and just turned and looked straight at me like dead in the eyes as if to be like, ha, gotcha. And I was just like, oh. Uh... You're, you're blaming the... A bad workman always blames his tools. I think this is user error. So you think I should have been more controlled with... If you swing it round and it clatters into it, that can't surely be the fault of the sling. I don't know. What but they... I've done what every rational man would do and just... Replaced them. Replaced it. Immediately <laughs> discarded it. So what have you gone for? Um, I've actually gone for, plug plug, um, a Harkila sling. Oh, yeah? Because... Well, it looks like quite a clever, like almost kind of slightly curved design. Oh, yeah. In the most slings, obviously, are just like a straight piece of material. Hmm. Um, but the Harkila one's got like a kink in the top of it. Yeah. So when it's over your shoulder, yeah. it kind of juts out into your body more to like, I suppose, hold it onto your body better okay. and stop it from like sliding off your shoulder. If you put it on one side. Yeah, if you're right-handed. If you're left-handed, then no Good one fun. cares about you. Classic. Yeah. Classic left-handed bias. I'm sick of it. Left-handed the, rifles. What are you, like, are 25% of the population? Rocking horse shit. Unbelievable. I've actually got a Harky Lissling, and I've had it for about 10 years. Not the same design, I don't think, Okay. as yours. It's just more of a traditional one. And it has held up pretty well, in fairness. So. Although, it does have the attachments... Are like little pieces of string. And I was a right fucker to get on and off. So this comes with both string and metal screw yes. attachments. I found neither to be very good. Oh. Like, I have to say, I'm afraid. Oh fuck. Because I lo I've lost the little metally things. So I was just very gonna, small. I was just gonna lock tight them. Yeah, but then what happens when you want to take like the eyelets off or whatever? You can have a. I'm just, I'm just gonna put them on a hands. set of dedicated swivels. Loctite them. When's if you sw when your swivels rust? And go grind them off. And go grind them off. That's the you will at some point here. need to take that out, and that's going to be a bastard. That's that's the problem. Then you'll lose it, which is what happened to me. And then you're left with little bits of string, which are. Fine. Okay, do you mean like his binds come with like leather bits? Yeah, that's what yeah, I mean. yeah. But like obviously, because I don't trust them, I've tied about a thousand knots in it. So if I ever want to take it off, <laughs> it just takes forever. Um, so there we go but it's okay. good I, like, I do like the Harkis but yeah, the Nigolo yeah. you know I, up until changing. now I've loved the Nigolo and I'm sure in a week or so's time mm -hmm. when I've got a bad back and a bad shoulder because I've walked so yeah. stupidly I'll go straight back to it in Scotland as well oh, if, okay, you go, yeah, if you yeah, ever go if you ever go up on the hill and you don't have a Nigolo you know basically you're, you're, you're an idiot so the other thing I did think is if if I could find someone handy with a sewing machine is to just get them to splice out the two plastic clips for me and just sew the sling back together. Oh, well, you don't want the ability to unclip and clip. I, don't, I never use it. No, I never use clips, actually. That's a good point. You could just wrap them in self-amalgamating rubber tape. Mm. What, like that kind of tape from, like, tennis racket handles? Yeah, it sticks to itself and it yeah. becomes all 
robbery and becomes one basically. Maybe they should make a Nigolo without the. Well, this is yeah. So I, I did ask. Um, my favourite leatherwork man, Dane and Dane and Blades. Dane and Blades, shout out. He made a sling for my kit plow, which is awesome because it's got little. It's a very nice one. Bullet things in it. I said, hypothetically, could you make a leather Nigolo style sling without stupid clips in the middle of it? What did he say? It keeps on edge. He said, we'll see. Oh. So he's, That's very non-committal. Yeah. I don't see why he's, not. He's going he's gonna to have a look. The thing is, the slight beauty of the Nigolo sling is it's quite bouncy and elastic because then you can kind of slip it off your shoulder. It's also quite sticky and rubbery, so it sticks to your jacket and doesn't slide around like a fucker. Um, excuse my language, whiskey talking. Um... I have a feeling leather would not be the right material for it. I it would look amazing. You'd look like a kind of Spartan or something. But I just feel are you, like... Are you envisaging wearing like some sort of cloth? Well, you'd be all and strapped up with sort of leather bits, wouldn't you? It'd be like yeah. kind of hosiery. Bondage. It would S&M. look like you are about to go to kind of, I don't know, some sort of lederhosen beer orgy or something. With a kip laugh. It's very German. You wear your hat. Yeah, yeah. Tom not only has a kip laugh, but he also has a, a, a German hat to go visit. So, so, to be fair, actually, I think this has happened since the last episode of, the, of, of Just Us on the podcast. So, What's it called, that hat, again? I don't know, it's just like a wide-brimmed hat, like okay. a, tri- trilby, a trilby hat. A trilby? Is that a, yeah, is it a trilby? Okay. So, basically, cut a long story short... I'm pale skinned, I'm ginger. In the summer, when I'm out trying to knock over Roebuck and uh, in August, Fallow, I am prone to getting a bit sunburned. Not only on, well, on every part of my body, basically. So, like, ears, back of my neck, face, no matter how much sun cream I put on. So, obviously, wear a hat, and I'm bald as well, so my head goes like burnt within about 10 seconds. So, Always wear a baseball cap, but that doesn't really solve the issue of my ears or the back of my neck. So I thought, what can I do to solve this? I'll just get a wide-brimmed hat. Provide a bit of shelter for my very... Don't pretend, Tom, that this is not a... This is a fashion choice. This is genuinely what happened. It was it... self-preservation. <laughs> um, and so... What, you could be what in what home in Bavaria. I would love to be home Hunting, in Bavaria. you know... I don't I think, know. Yeah. Do they have chamois in Bavaria? I think I've they just, do. I've just googled it. So I you think could it literally is. be up a. You could be yodeling with this hat on. It is like it, yeah. So it is a trill. The bit. sound of music would have you on its set, and you would not look out of place. I you can, could be. You could be like the chamois hunter in the sound of music with this hat. I look forward to it. Hang on, is there a chamois hunter in the sound of music? There were. You know, it's like. Was it? It's like the Austrian Alps, isn't it? There yeah. Must be. So it's anyway, like, I bought one of these hats. It has proved very popular with some people, but it's also proved very unpopular with others. Slightly I do like it, but it's too good an opportunity to take the piss out of you for looking like a, <laughs> <as> the Germans. <laughs> You're all just jealous. Um, so it's so another thing for the kit plough. Yeah, kit plough. Do you only wear it when you have, have the kit plough? No. I've I, never seen you wear it with the um, tika, actually. I wore it the other day. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Would you ever wear it to the office? I'd only ever wear it stalking. <laughs> and in, Where no one's going to see yeah. you. <laughs> and in fairness, I think... Oh, no, to be fair, I, guess I have worn it a few times recently and it's not been sunny. Okay. It's quite... It, yeah, in the rain, it's quite useful as well. Well, there's a it's reason a the Germans around. wear them. Yeah. A little felt. Are they felt cotton? Uh, I think it's felt. I guess it's the equivalent of, like, the, like the, the European hat. cowboy hat. Yeah. It serves a similar purpose. Yeah. Protects us protects from the elements. Yeah. I did. Someone said to me, I don't know whether they were just saving my feelings, but they did say it may disguise the outline of you better to a deer as well. Mm-hmm. In terms of, like, obviously, our silhouette as a human being is quite yeah. obvious to a deer, whereas if you've got a... <laughs> I mean, you could wear like a Mexican massive hat, and that would really freak them out. They'd be like, what the hell is that? They just think you're a friendly German tourist. Yeah. Oh, hello. I'm like, oh, sorry. Guten Tag. Kip laughed. 
So they, those have been my own purchases, which is much less exciting than previous mm. episodes and purchase updates. I feel like we both kind of calmed down on the whole purchase front. We have a little bit. I think just because we've gotten busy with actually doing the business of shooting the bloody deer. It's true. I, um, I do find in the summer I, I go on a bit of a spending spree. Yeah. Because I'm not killing. And so I'm like, well... Yeah. You're like, what could I buy? Yeah, what could I buy to make next season even better? Mm. And then, I think I did speak about this on the last podcast, but my hunter's mate uh, dragging hook yeah. I've been using almost daily. I'm quite jealous of that. I think that might be something I have a look at. Because sto- you got yours at the stalking show, didn't you? Mm. I Very think I might effective. have to look at that. Very effective. And I'm about to try it in Scotland next week. If you're listening to this, actually, we will hopefully have some... There will definitely be some content on my Instagram account. There may well even be some YouTube videos. Oh, my God. You never know. If it's good. Although, if the weather is absolutely dog shit, then I may just not be able to. Here's a video of some rain. Yeah. Also, I love how you say, if the weather is dog shit, you're going to Scotland in November. (laughs) Of course it will be terrible. In fairness, okay, I went to Scotland, actually, with a... uh, blank um this is embarrassing uh with what's his name from the stalking show david freer david freer from the stalking show last year in january yeah i went up to argyle in january beautiful yeah beautiful sun every single day not a sp- i didn't get rain on once you sure you went to scotland i went to scotland it was literally unseasonal it was unbelievable well so I i'm look hoping f- for another week of that i look forward to seeing you in your swim shorts if it's like that scotland. i'll be i will genuinely be in my swim shorts because it gets bloody hot. Look um, forward to it. But it will mean that I can film some pretty epic videos. Yeah. Um, and I will film the, the the hook and sling in action because that is going to be mighty useful yeah, for dragging hinds be. off the bloody hill because that's a pain. So talking of David Freer yes. and the stalking show, yes. we should, and it, people will probably have seen this on our Instagram, uh, or Instagrams, plural, um, is that we are going to the stalking show again. Uh, not only are we going to the stalking show again, but we are doing uh, doing it bigger and better than last year. So last year, any of you that saw us there, uh, we had a kind of selfie frame thing. We were giving out some stickers and we had a weird cupboard somewhere that we um, uh, recorded some podcasts from with people who were brave enough to come into the cupboard. Um, this year... We think we are having a stand in conjunction with Alex from Hunter Gatherer Cooking, I believe. We hope. This is how it's looking at the minute. We w- it's a long way away, so yeah. you know, plans may well change, but um, that's the idea. We're we- going to ha- hopefully have some interesting guests to talk about. Mm-hmm. We might have some products to look at, potentially, depending on who gets involved. We might be going around to sort of talk to people. Um, we will definitely be at the pub on Saturday evening. Yes. And Friday evening if you're there a bit early and a bit keen. If you're a bit keen, you'd have to be quite keen to come on Friday night. So, so some people, because we were in, what were we in, a premier? No, we weren't in a premier. We, what's what's we below a, a premier lodge. in? We were in a travel lodge. I don't, is that below or above? I feel like it's below. Mm, Basically, when, when we were looking at buying our accommodation last year, we were like cheapest hotel Staffordshire. And the Premier Inn was out of our budget. Yeah, it was actually. So we went for a travel. Like, was it even a travel I think it lodge? Was, I think it was sixty pounds. Yeah, which is between us. Between us, thirty quid each for the night. Not bad. Good value. No breakfast. No breakfast. Oh no! So there was an option for a continental breakfast that consisted of a cereal bar. Yeah, I've had that and before, and they hand they, you go out to reception, and they're like, yeah, yeah. they're like, where's breakfast? And they hand you a, the most depressing paper bag yeah. that you've ever had in your whole life. And inside is a very small sachet of porridge that you put in the microwave, but you have no microwave. You might have a very crusty old croissant that's kind of in a bag yeah. that's never been opened. Um, and no coffee, obviously. Uh, and what else? Yeah, I think, I think a cereal bar. That is Do literally we, it. We were offered ours on check-in, and I declined them on both of our behalves. So it was a cereal bar, uh, an orange juice that, you know how most of them say, like, never from concentrate on it? Mm-hmm. This one said, from concentrate on it. Ooh, it was like it was proud of being from concentrate yeah. and basically radioactive. Yeah. Um, and that was it. And she was like, these will be a fiver each. And I was like, mm. you can fuck off. Yeah, fuck that shit. So, can't really where I was going with this, but 
Oh, that's right. So when we were in our travel lodge last year, there were some people in there, because they'd travelled such a long way, they had stayed the Friday night oh, before. Oh, right, yeah. They'd made like a full How weekend out of it. Tra- I suppose if you come from Scotland. Yeah. But Staffordshire's kind of... Well, like... I mean, to be fair, even if you came from, like, Dorset or yeah, Devon, that's, that's a bloody best, long yeah, way. That's country. Well, there we go. We'll be at the pub or wherever there is yeah. drinks and things going on on Friday night. So come and hassle Tom and he'll buy you a pint. Indeed. <laughs> um, what else have we got to Harry, buy your dinner. Steady on. Um, we have had some further interesting guests come on the podcast. We have. So keep your ears and eyes open. So we've had... So these, these episodes are live, so you guys will have heard them. We've had Owen Beardsmore, who was really yeah. interesting, and obviously we've, Excellent. we've mentioned already some of like the kind of hints and tips he gave us. It was interesting. He brought in a, a whole different kind of demographic of listeners, which was really clear from like the listener questions we did beforehand. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he had lots of European listeners, but also lots of people who are very interested in row stalking, but and like mm. row buck stalking and like managing populations to get good heads um we've had nick rout from the bds on yep. which was really interesting yeah that uh, has just come out if you're well not if you're listening now because it just came out when we recorded. probably this. came out six months ago yeah um <laughs> uh you talked about the wild i always get this wrong wild venison quality assurance scheme yep that's it which i i still have my doubts about i think yeah we had quite a candid conversation with Nick about it and I think we kind of all agreed that it needs adopting really by supermarkets game dealers for it to actually have any meaningful impact potentially and it's not quite kind of off the ground yet I think they haven't had that many people sign up for it yet Um, but you know as a as an idea as a concept I think it's it's in the right direction isn't it right I worry because I work in farming, and I saw everyone uh, start to sign up years and years ago to the Red Tractor scheme, which, for any of you that don't know what it is, basically, if you some products that you buy from the supermarket will have a little red tractor on it. Uh, lots of people think that means it's British. What it actually means is that the producer of it has signed up to various quality assurance obligations and they have an annual membership and an annual inspection to ensure that they adhere to those quality uh, assurances. And at the time, it was, well, if you sign up to Red Tractor as a farmer, you'll get paid a premium for all your produce that is able to be sold with this quality mark on it. And that's what happened for about a year. And then basically all the supermarkets and all the um, buyers turned around and were like, well, until, unless you are Red Tractor, we're just not buying your produce anymore. And it then meant that essentially no one got a premium for their produce because they were like, well, it's just the new normal. And every mm. all the producers suddenly had to adhere to those new standards and adopt all of that extra cost for no mm. extra paid benefit. And the ones that couldn't just disappeared because yeah. no one would buy their produce. Yeah. So my fear, which may prove to be completely unfounded, is that with the Venison Wild Quality Assurance Scheme, the people who adopt it will probably continue to get their venison bought, but they will be the very large producers. Because if you look at a lot of the requirements under the scheme, like you've got to have a concrete apron outside your larder, which, and unless you have like a proper dedicated larder, you're not going to have that. Like if you store deer in your garage in your coke fridge that doesn't you're not going to have it you've got to have dedicated like waste disposal systems and all the rest of it which again unless you're an estate somewhere you're not going to have Mm -hmm. so the the big people will be fine and they'll get their venison bought and they probably won't get a premium for it the small people i think you'll just end up being scuppered and Mm -hmm. you're gonna be able to get rid of it and that's my fear to play devil's advocate to that fire away Firstly, on the market point, when you're dealing with the farm side of things, because farmers pretty much exclusively sell their meat to supermarkets, that's not quite how we have it with stalking, with the whole game dealer setup, because we don't really, as stalkers, we don't have any access to supermarkets. We have to go through the game dealers 
So if as like a mid-level estate producing 100, 200 carcasses who can sign up for the scheme can suddenly sell their venison straight to Waitrose and cut out the middleman, maybe that will, you know... But I don't think they will. Like, take your average estate. They're not going to... It still needs to go to a processor to be skinned, cleaned, butchered down before it goes to the supermarket. Supermarket aren't going to take a whole carcass. And if you're a game dealer, like, surviving on wafer-thin margins, Mm. you're not going to say, we'll take carcasses from people who are quality assurance marked and non-quality assurance marked and somehow develop some sort of system to keep the carcasses segregated, have separate... Hmm. chillers or areas within chillers separate freezers separate like butchery areas so they're like for ease i can see them going okay well who do we get the most and probably i hate to say it consistent carcasses from Hmm. probably the people who are quality assurance schemes so they'll turn around and go a bit like the whole head shooting thing we'll pay yeah for that anything else we'll take it if we're feeling great on the day Hmm. if not tough luck yeah that's my only fear with it yeah, no, it's 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 an interesting worry. It is, but you know, getting ven- getting wild venison into the supermarkets would be amazing. Has got to be positive for the market. Yeah, because yeah. that opens up a massive amount of demand mm. that we currently don't have, and you know that might push up the price per kilo by a quid or two quid, or mm. you know who knows if it, if people who are able to do clever marketing, clever cuts that consumers suddenly think oh that's quite interesting i haven't had a venison lollipop before but it's my new favorite thing or whatever then you know all the better and ultimately with with venison i think you're kind of you're kind of bloke who is shooting five deer a year chucking them in his garage in a coke fridge you know doesn't have proper facilities i hate to say it but should they be selling venison to a supermarket yeah you know, some people are probably going to shoot me down for saying this, but if we're trying to, as an industry, prove to the supermarkets that we can provide a consistent, uh, you know, high quality product, basically, you know, how can we, how can we compete if we're not going to be able to be meeting those minimum criteria and being able to provide consistently? I mean, it's not to say that someone who is only shooting five carcasses a year couldn't do that, but. If you do, if you don't have yeah, yeah. if you don't have the facilities to do it, you know, then maybe maybe you shouldn't be supplying it to mm. people like supermarkets and maybe to put local pubs or butchers or making them into sausages or something is a, a better outlet for it for everyone involved. Um, but I think you know a rising tide what is it a rising rising sea lifts all ships. You know if we if we get it's access very to poignant, Harry. You know, if Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Asda's, maybe not Asda's, you know, maybe Little and Audi get on board and start stocking wild venison because, you know, there's only farm stuff in there at the minute as far as I'm aware. That could be massive. That could be massive. Um, but I, I don't know enough about these supply yeah. chains really to, you know, I don't think anyone really does to have an idea of what it's going to do to the prices of things. But, um, yeah, it's got it's got to be positive. Yeah. Well, let's hope so. I think so another that, another interesting thing, sorry, just to interject, is that we, we were at a meeting the other day um, and we were talking about this very subject and in terms of actually what what drives consumer behaviour and is 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 the consumer kind of reticence for buying venison anything to do with the quality of the product? Because, you know, ultimately I'm not sure it, it really is. No. Um, and... I, I, think I think the question was raised as to whether a consumer would know, care, understand if venison had a quality assurance scheme associated with it and what that actually meant because people probably wrongly assume with Red Tractor that it means something to do with animal welfare, which as far as I'm aware it doesn't. It's mainly to do with how the farms run and if you're keeping in your chemicals in the right place. So, yeah, another I, question. Yeah. So that that was a very interesting podcast with Nick Rao. Go and listen to that. Go and listen to that and let us know your thoughts. We then did one with Peter Jones, didn't we, from Capriola's yep. Club, which yep. will be coming out in December. So yep. you probably have already listened to that by the time you listen to this. Yeah. Um, and then we also recorded one with Paul Hill from Carinium Rifle Range. Um, yep. 
And I mean, Paul is a, uh, a training assessor provider, so he does DSC1, DSC2 courses, Humane Dispatch, sort of all sort of courses like that. Um, he has been a professional stalker himself, um, runs obviously a rifle range, um, and does a lot of uh, sort of, I'd call it like contract reloading for people. So like mm-hmm. if people want something loaded up or want a custom load made for their rifle, he'll he'll do it. And we, I think we spent quite a lot of time on that podcast mm-hmm. really talking about the whole copper, yeah. or sorry, I shouldn't say copper, lead-free bullets um, debate mm-hmm. in terms of what caliber should, we, should people be looking at, mm-hmm. which calibers work best, what types of bullet, what brands, etc. And mm-hmm. I... I mean, I could have sat and talked to Paul for hours about that because I'm just a bit nerdy and find that fascinating. Yeah. Um, I mean, what he doesn't know about calibers, copper, is not worth knowing. In my view, I mean, I found it so illuminating from someone who has a very basic understanding of ballistics and how copper works. And his advice seemed to fly in the face of what I had been told um, about copper, you know, in terms of speed and all Mm. all of that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, the more you, more you think about it, it, it seems to make sense. Yeah, which uh, and I, I think that that has been my experience. I would say with copper, because I think the first advice that came out was go lighter and faster for caliber. Yeah, which turned my three hundred eight into an absolute laser beam. But at the same time, I got a lot more runners than I ever had before, and I think that that could have put me off copper and that's possibly what has put a lot of people off copper because they've had those runners and gone oh god what's happened it must be copper um without thinking well i've gone lighter and faster for caliber what about if i just stuck to exactly the same or even god forbid went heavier for caliber Mm. and say i've got one rifle that use 130 grain bullets in and one use 150 grain bullets in and i hate to say it i think the 150 grain bullets kill better than the 130s. The only reason I use the 130s in the other rifle is they are flatter. Mm. Whereas the 150s, it's you, even a fallow, it's like they've been hit with a brick. Like they just, you can see them like take take a bullet and you're like, that has been hit and mm. that's been hit good and they don't go far. What like, about the meat damage? Meat damage, I'd say, is better with the 150s. You get less yeah. bruising, yeah. for sure. Well, it's what Paul was it's saying, a, basically. Isn't yeah. It? Um, it's for sure a bigger exit wound than the 130s mm. like I, on some deer it's I don't know uh, tell you what you can use our whiskey bottle that we've got here on the table it's probably the size of the diameter of a bottle of a oh my bottle God. of whiskey it's enormous yeah like big old exit wound but that's like what's ripped through but then as soon as you skin it it's absolutely fine you've just but it looks like you just cut a big hole on the side of it. That's it. Whereas the 130s, you'll have a smaller exit, smaller entrance, um, but you'll have a lot more blood meat around both sides. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I still shoot with 110 grains, and it does make a, mo- a fair old mess of the carcasses, I will admit. Yeah. If you hit them in the wrong place. I think if you catch a, like a, catch a rib or yeah. a few shoulder shoot them, then... Devastation. It's not, it's not pretty. They look like they've been shot. Something I mean, they have, in fairness. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, it's all about, and we talk about this in the, the, the Paul Hill podcast, it's all about what you're comfortable with, ultimately, yeah. and I'm, I'm happy. That, I'm, I'd, rather, I'd rather have a flatter, faster calibre and deal with some, you know, slightly worse carcasses because, for me, it seems to work um, and it seems to kill better and it's... It suits my style of shooting, so there's no right or wrong answer. No. Um, so those are some of the podcasts we have recorded. Um, I'm trying to think who we've got lined up for the next next week. We may actually be in a position where we haven't got any lined up, which is a bit, feels a bit weird. I think um, we probably do. I think we have. I know we've got one who I'm not allowed to tell you who it is yet, but he is a deer manager of a deer park somewhere. That's all I'm allowed to say at this stage. Because yeah. he's he's not had sign off from his employer to be able to Ooh. reveal yet. Sounds but, exciting. Yeah, okay. quite a prestigious place. So yeah. we've definitely got some people. We probably can't divulge who they are at this point. Yeah, um, but 
rest assured there are more incredibly exciting podcasts to come and possibly by the time we come round to it we'll have had we'll have done some uh, at the stalking show by yeah. this point yeah yeah definitely we'll be, we'll be putting those up as well mm. um, so yeah do keep your eyes peeled for announcements about the about the stalking show by this time we probably have even made some more um, sort of videos and announcements about it so yeah awesome keep, keep your eyes peeled well, there we go guys Hope you've enjoyed uh, another episode from us. Um, we are signing off and we'll um, catch you on the next one. See you soon.